Hi, welcome back everyone to ICT for Sustainability. Today we will talk about footprint. We know we live on a planet with finite resources. We also know that our economy is always trying to grow. We try to achieve more growth, but we know we have finite resources on this planet. There is a contradiction right there. Continued economic growth. Now, that insight is not new. That insight was brought up in the early 1970s by Donella and Dennis Meadows and colleagues in their report, Limits to Growth. It was a report to the Club of Rome. And in that report, they said, we already know that we have a strong reliance on some non-renewable resources. We are relying on fossil fuels. We know there is a limited amount of those in the earth. We see that our consumption of those is ever increasing with the way how economy is evolving, with the way how industrialization has been evolving, with the way how technology has been evolving. And that means within a short amount of time, we're gonna get ourselves into big trouble. A very early indicator of making things more efficient does not mean that we're gonna save resources was already discovered in 1837 and that's called the Jevons Paradox. So in the Jevons Paradox, a gentleman in the UK, his name was Jevons, he found out in a study that after the UK had found out how to more efficiently burn coal, and therefore you would think if we can now burn it more efficiently, we're gonna generate more energy from the same amount of coal we're not gonna use more, we're actually gonna use less of it because we can create the same amount of energy with less coal. But what he observed was the opposite. We started using more coal, we burned more fossil fuels because of ever increasing energy demands. Now energy was available more efficiently, so it got cheaper, so therefore we wanted to use more of it. And we see this trend to this day. We used to have maybe one personal computer in one home in the 80s and now most of us own several devices a phone a computer a laptop a tablet maybe not all of them maybe you own one maybe you own two but most of us have more than one device most of us who are able to afford it granted that not everybody in the world and if you're watching this video then chances are reasonably high that you own at least one device so the question is, if we already knew 1972, what have we done about that? They had a 30-year update and said, honestly, now the predictions look way worse. So we have not been able to steer significantly against the strong desire for consumption that we have developed. There are certain historic reasons why we've started to get into this consumerism thing. So we all know in the 1930s and 40s, we had a big world war. And after that world war, everybody tried to restore the economy, tried to restore a good way of living. And we all wanted to live a good life with a house and maybe a car and certain consumer goods. and then advertisement tried to keep us in the spiral of always wanting more and still tries to this day because that's how companies make money they sell goods and so in addition to the sales of 
what we definitely need for sustaining our lives. On top of that, the desire to have the new thing, the fancy thing. And then there was this tiny little evil concept introduced that's called planned obsolescence. Planned obsolescence is when I create a device and I make it last for less time than what it could last. And we've seen the first occurrences of planned obsolescence since electric light bulbs. And since nylon tights. Both of those were examples where, where the first prototypes would last way longer. The first electric light bulbs had a much stronger wire. It would burn for many, many more hours than later light bulbs did. And the companies figured out, oh, we're not going to be selling enough if they last forever. So how about we make the wire thinner? That way people have to replace them every once in a while. Same for nylon tights. The first ones were pretty sturdy. They would never rip. We're not going to sell enough of this. Can we make the threads thinner so that people have to replace them more often? And this we see progressing to today's technology. There are technology comp companies out there who have recently been found out to, to do the same thing to their products, whether that is installing a little tiny counter in a hardware device that after a certain number of doing what the device is supposed to do will say error and it doesn't really explain what's going on. But that company was found out to be producing a printer that would just start failing after a certain thousands number of pages. But also with other devices, we know that from mobile phones, all of a sudden there's this inexplicable slowdown after we've had that for a while. And granted, some of that goes back to software that is evolving and that um, is relying on newer devices that they know have more capacity, so they want to make use of it. And it takes a lot of effort to maintain software compatible with all the older hardware versions. So there is a trade-off to be made of how many new things we can put out there and to which history version we can maintain a software product. But there is still way more technology built to get rid of sooner rather than later. It's often also because it allows us to make the design more sleek, it allows us to make the devices smaller, and so that will maybe also create a less reliable and less lasting hardware component. So in the end, we have to decide what we want to go for. Long long lifetime, or, or the sleeker, slimmer design. And we know where the current trends are heading. So think about that when you choose to buy your next device. What are the maxims going to be in the characteristics that you are looking for? So when we look at this planned obsolescence, when we look at wanting to maintain a good lifestyle, when we look at getting seduced by ads, and sometimes also getting that notion from some people around us that we need to keep up in some way, then we need to really listen inside if that is something that we want to follow, or if we find our own way and make our own choices. Because what we're creating is a big ecological footprint. And that concept of footprint has also been around since the 1970s in the so-called iPad equation. And the iPad equation means the environmental impact that we are creating is defined by the population of a certain country or the entire planet times the affluence. Like how much can we really afford times, times the technology. I, was, I just thought it was time, but no, it's technology. I'm glad I looked it up in my notes. So the environmental impact that we create is characterized by the population that we have times their affluence times the technology that we use. And that technology, yes, it can help us save emissions of a certain kind if it's 
something that makes a process more efficient. But also, it allows us to do so many things efficiently and it enables so many things that it thereby creates a larger footprint. That's the two-folded thing about ICT. So we can, we can see it in both ways. But that part we'll talk about in a different lesson. So for now, I just want to stick with that iPad equation. And you may say, well, this is, this is very generic. This is for an entire country. We can look at this on a global level. Yes, we know the population of our planet has been increasing a lot. And we know that economic growth is something that we're still pursuing and we're certainly still developing technology. Therefore, our environmental impact seems to be ever increasing and not at a small rate. But what does that mean on an individual level? Because we know, yes, it's important to take global action, but in the end, our globe is composed by a ton of individuals. So trying to break that down for an individual person, we need a slightly different way of calculating this. So in the 1990s, Bill Rees and his back then student Matthias Wackernagel they came out with the ecological footprint. And the ecological footprint is individual per person. If you search for ecological footprint on your preferred search engine, then you will find the website by Bill Rees that will allow you to calculate your own ecological footprint. It will ask you things like, how often do you travel? And um, which means do you use to travel? And um, it will ask you how far you commute and so on and so forth. And that way your ecological footprint is created. Now, one of the things that Bill Rees has pointed out in his work many times, and he's not the only one, um, is that we have one planet, right? But how many planets are we using? Are we using resources in a way that the renewable parts of it have a chance to get replenished? Are we staying below the rate of replenishment? Nope, we are certainly not. So we are living as if we had, depending on which country you're in, I think the world average is about two and a half planets that we use, but in certain industrialized countries, we use up to four times of what we should be using just for the planet to be able to replenish renewable resources and to absorb waste that we're producing to the extent that that is possible. If we create toxic waste that does not break down, we're in big time trouble. And we have been creating a lot of that and we still do create it. Some of the other waste can be absorbed, reabsorbed and broken down so what are we going to do about this? And how can, how can we find ways as individuals to decrease our illogical footprint? Maybe you've heard of the concept of circularity. The concept of circularity says anything that we take out of the earth and that we build something with we want to be able to break that down at the end of using it in the form that we created out of it and then turn it into a new product that we can reuse again. So circularity is looking at a cradle to cradle approach. You know, when we produce something, say a paper product, the first time, it's this beautiful, brilliant white paper, really shiny. And then when we recycle that, we can say, yep, great, we recycled this. It's still paper or it's paper again. Now it's recycled paper. And um, we've even found a way to bleach that. So it looks white again, it's perfect. But we know that the quality of it is still a little different. And then you recycle it a second time. It maybe it goes into cardboard. And after being cardboard, maybe we can reuse it in in some newspaper, and after it goes to newspaper, I'm not sure what the next stage down is. So you see that those products are not on the same level. To use a silly example, um, 
buy the cheapest white toilet paper and buy the cheapest recycling toilet paper and just feel that difference. And there you see that recycling is not cycling on the same level, it's actually down cycling. So we lose some part of the quality of the product. Therefore, recycling is definitely better than throwing away, but recycling is not the ultimate goal. Our vision for the future would be that we can maintain circularity, that we can find a cradle to cradle approach for our products. One last pointer that I wanna give you for a couple of these concepts for planned obsolescence, for the iPad equation, for ecological footprint, and for cradle to cradle, and how on earth we ended up using so much stuff and overusing so much of it, and what other levers also play into that system, that is illustrated in the story of stuff. The story of stuff was created by Annie Leonard, and they have a couple of great illustrated videos out there that will show the circle of products and the many things that go wrong with it. They also look into different product categories. They look into electronics, they look into cosmetics, and I think they do a really good job at explaining all the little variables that go into that system, as well as a few avenues out of it. So go look up the story of stuff after you've finished this one. Thank you.